In Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4, the writer of Hebrews states that, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. In studying this, we looked at the fact that this was great salvation was first spoken by the Lord, even though given him prophecy and promise uh, prior to that time, Many of the prophecies that are given set, were set forth hundreds of years before this great salvation came. But the idea that is first spoken by the Lord, the idea is not first as far as time is concerned, but it's the fact that He is the fount of it. He is the source of it. He brings it into existence. Uh, and we see that being used in further passage. Uh, Hebrews 2 and verse 10. Hebrews 5 and verse 8 and verse 9. And so, he brought salvation into existence. Not that he was the first to speak of it in order of time. But without him, there would be no great salvation. When did he begin to speak it? Well, certainly during his personal ministry, he did. Uh, but it did not come into existence till he died. He was made perfect through sufferings, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. And so it was not till after Christ died or suffered that he set forth the terms of that great salvation. And we generally refer to that as the great commission. That we must believe, we must repent, we must be baptized in order to have the remission of sins or salvation. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16, and Luke 24, 46 and 47. But then the text also says it was confirmed by the apostles. The Lord spoke it. The apostles confirmed it. To confirm means to validate, to make sure, to make firm, or to establish it. The apostles validated that great salvation that Jesus spoke of. The apostles were confirming what Jesus taught. In John 14 and verse 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now then, that certainly is not limited to the Great Commission. It deals with all that Jesus commanded, that they were going to bring all those things, or the Spirit was going to bring all those things to their remembrance. You also see this in Matthew's account of the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. They were given the command, you teach them to observe all things. 
Now, some have tried to limit that all things to simply those things that he is stating now. As we have record, the Great Commission. And they want to ignore, because they want to eliminate Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John from being part of the gospel. And they want to eliminate thus everything else that he taught. And Jesus is saying, no, you can't do that. You've got to command them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now then, part of that command, yes, are those things that he has just stated that they must believe, or individuals must believe, that they must repent, and that they must be baptized for salvation or the remission of sins. That has to be taught, as well as all that he taught during his earthly ministry. Those things were teachings and commands that he was giving for the church, for the New Testament age, even though he lived during the Old Testament age. But in dealing with this great salvation, Jesus speaks of faith. For example, in John 14, he speaks of both faith in the Father and in himself. When he says, let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe also in me. And so he teaches both a faith in God the Father and a faith in himself. In John the 8th chapter, and verse 24, Jesus says, I say therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am. I realize King James adds he there, but it's in italics because it's not in the original. And it would be better understood if it was not added by the King James translators. It is literally that if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. He is setting forth his deity. The fact that he is that great I am. And if you don't believe that, you're going to die in your sins. And so while they believe that God was, or the Father was God, you believe in God, there's also that need to believe in himself. And without believing that Jesus is that great I am, he says you'll die in your sins. Well, we go to the apostles. That's what Jesus stated. The apostles confirm the same thing. In Hebrews 11th chapter and verse 6, Hebrew writer says, Without faith. It is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is necessary. Faith in God's existence. And so he was affirming in that, the very thing that Jesus had taught. They were giving confirmation to the fact that we must believe in God. But also, Jesus says, you have to believe in me. You have to believe that I am. Well, when we go to Pentecost in Acts 2nd chapter, we start seeing that that exact thing. Starting in verse 32. And in verse 33 says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which he now see and hear. And he quotes David. David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith, unto him, he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. He concludes in verse 36 then by saying, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter was on this day of Pentecost instilling faith in Jesus as being that one who is that great I am. 
that he is that one who was raised from the dead, and thus he is Lord. And he is the Messiah, as was prophesied of the Old Testament and spoken of during that period of time. And so Jesus taught, you must believe in God, but you also have to believe in me. And when we come to Acts, the second chapter, we now see them, the apostles, and in particular Peter, preaching that Jesus is God. Preaching and teaching and instilling in them faith in Jesus as being God's Son. And when I say Son, I don't mean descendancy. It's dealing with nature. He has the nature, he has the characteristics of God, and thus he is God. Jesus also taught repentance. In Luke, the 13th chapter, and in verse 3, Jesus states, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Some have summarized this as repent or perish. And that's basically a good summation of what Jesus states here. Repent or perish. If you don't repent, you will perish. Now that's Jesus' teaching. You've got to repent in order to be saved. You've got to repent or else you're going to perish. The Lord stated it. The apostles gave confirmation to it. Paul, again, in Acts, the second chapter, after instilling that faith in Jesus as being God, both Lord and Christ, when they asked, Men, brethren, what shall we do? Peter's response, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. He taught the necessity there of repentance. Why? Because Jesus had stated, you repent or you perish. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now then the apostles are giving confirmation to that which Jesus taught. Later on in Acts 17th chapters, Paul was on Mars Hill and speaking to the Athenians and philosophers of his day. He comes to this point and says that the times of this ignorance God winked at or overlooked, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. There was that need for repentance, and then he explains why in verse 31. And the reason being is that each and every person is going to stand before a God and give account of himself, what he has done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or evil, and he's given assurance of that in the fact that he raised Jesus from the dead. Repent or else judgment is going to come upon you. You're going to be judged and found wanting unless you repent. And so he has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Jesus taught it. The apostles gave confirmation of it. Jesus also taught that we must confess. In Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 32 and 33... Jesus states that whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Here is an affirmation or a denial that Jesus is going to make in relationship to God. It is based upon whether or not one confesses or does not confess. If you deny me, I'll deny you. If you confess, I'll confess you. And so the necessity of a confession that is to be made. Well, do the apostles confirm this? Jesus taught it. Do the apostles confirm it? 
In Romans 10th chapter, verses 9 and verse 10, Paul would write that thou shalt confess with thy mouth, or that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus had stated, If you confess me, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me, I'll deny you before my Father. Paul comes along now in Romans and says, We must believe, and with that belief we believe unto righteousness, and we with the mouth... Confession is made to salvation. And by the way, the word translated unto in both the first and the second part of uh, verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's a Greek word, ice or ace depending on who you listen to. And that little Greek preposition is always forward-looking. You are believing, looking forward to, being to righteousness. You make a confession, looking forward to salvation. Our denominational friends want to come to this passage and say, see, all you have to do is confess Christ and you'll be saved. But that's not what this verse is saying. It's saying when you make that confession, you're looking forward to that salvation. It doesn't say that you have now salvation, but you're looking forward to it. Why? Because it's necessary in that salvation process, even as belief is necessary in that salvation process. And without either one of them, we cannot be saved. Why? Because that's what Jesus taught, and that's what was confirmed by the apostles. But then, baptism. Jesus said, as, we, <coughs> as recorded in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way even to the end of the world. Now we've explained this verse several times, but it bears repeating. The King James doesn't do us any favors when it says, teach uh, teach all nations. It literally is uh, making disciples of all nations. Go, and literally it is as you go, make disciples of all nations. We could say, as you go from this building, make disciples of all nations. That's to each and every one of us. He then explains how the disciples are going to be made, baptizing them and teaching them. The teaching there in verse 20. <clears throat> Those are modal participles, it's what, as they're called. They are the method, the mode, the way in which one is made a disciple. King James has baptizing them in the name. It literally is into the name. Baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost. The idea of baptizing them into the name of deity is the idea that you're being baptized into a relationship with those divine three. You come into a new relationship. A new relationship, which is we are a new creature in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We have passed from death unto life. When? When we come into that new relationship with deity. 
No wonder Paul would write in Galatians, the third chapter, that through the faith we become a child of God. You're all children of God by the faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In that act of baptism, you're becoming a child of God. You are coming into that relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Without that baptism, you do not have that relationship. The denominational world wants to eliminate baptism from that aspect of salvation... If you do so, then you have no relationship with God. That's the problem of one of the many problems of that view. Because Jesus is saying, you're baptized into that relationship with those divine three. That's the only way that we can have that relationship with God. In Mark's account, you have much the same thing. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You must believe and be baptized for what? To come into that relationship with deity. Or as Mark puts it, to be saved. To be saved and to come into that relationship with deity or with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit saying the same thing in different ways. You come into a relationship with deity. What is it? You've been saved. And by the way, the salvation here does not deal with eternal salvation. A lot of times we confuse that within our mind. It has nothing to do with eternal salvation. This has, if you tie in the... Luke's account, Luke 24, 46, and 47, it's dealing with that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. What is it? The salvation is dealing with the remission of sins. It is being saved from our past sins. Now then, that gives us the hope of being saved eternally in heaven. You cannot be saved in heaven without this. But this is dealing with salvation from past sins so that we now have a relationship with God. Now that's what Jesus taught. Did the apostles confirm this same principle? The need for being baptized? Well, look at, again, Acts the second chapter. When upon being convicted of their sin of crucifying the Son of God, they cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter's response, repent. We've already noticed the need for repentance. You either repent or perish, Jesus said. And Peter is confirming that here. You repent and be baptized. Here's that act of baptism where Peter and the apostles are confirming what Jesus said. And he says, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of there is literally in the name of, it means by his authority. It's not the same Greek construction as Matthew 28. It's different. You do this by the authority. What's by the authority of? It's by His command, by His authorization, the direct statements, the implication, the examples that have been given. So, you be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for what purpose? For the remission of your sins. Now, that's what Jesus had taught. That is, again, coming into that relationship with deity. That is that salvation of Mark's account, the remission of sins of Luke's account. Perfectly confirmed by the apostles. Later on in 1 Peter, the third chapter, 
And verse 21, Peter states, The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism saves us. What does baptism do? Well, Jesus says, baptism saves us. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. To be made a disciple, you have to be baptized into that relationship with deity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is for the remission of our sins. Now, in Peter's confirmation of that, and we'll just add water baptism, because that's the like figure. He had just spoken of the salvation that was seen by Noah in the flood, that he was saved by water, and that like figure of water salvation, baptism saves us. We have the remission of our sins through that act of baptism. When Jesus gives this great commission in which he sets forth the terms of entrance into the church, the terms of entrance for salvation, when we come over and we look at the apostles, it was confirmed throughout the book of Acts we could go through the cases of conversion in Acts and we could see continued confirmation of what Jesus stated there as recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we, recall, and we call the Great Commission. Those cases of conversion confirm, give confirmation to what Jesus stated. Now, Lord willing, next week we'll look at the aspect of God bearing them witness. But that which Jesus taught and was confirmed by the apostles, it's made firm, it's established by the apostles, is something that you and I must do today if we're going to have salvation, the remission of our sins. We cannot have the remission of our sins without following the same thing that Jesus taught and was confirmed by the apostles. And so if this morning you have not obeyed that gospel of Jesus Christ, we would encourage you to do those things that Jesus taught, do those things that were confirmed by the apostles, for people to have salvation, for them to have the remission of their past sins, to come into that relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you've become a Christian, but you haven't lived in such a way that God would be pleased with your life, and you want to repent of your sins and come back to faithfulness to Him, then why not do so as we stand and sing the invitation?